Maybe we'll wait for a few more minutes and then we'll start. Meanwhile, you can look at this wonderful poster. So this implies that people all over are, uh, are working to call the corporations that make weapons, that make nuclear weapons into account. All right, 7.03, should we start? All right, uh, welcome everybody who is here. I welcome on behalf of the of MAPA's Nuclear Disarmament Working Group and the Raytheon campaign. We are starting a brand new campaign to join the Raytheon campaign and the Nuclear Disarmament Working Group to work on nuclear weapons and to call Raytheon into account about how and what they are doing to, uh, to make this world a, a dangerous place, increasing the danger of nuclear weapons. We are all faced in the news constantly about what's happening in the Ukraine. And we all hear the talk about nuclear weapons, the possible use of nuclear weapons. At the same time, we in the US are sending weapons to the Ukraine. And now we want to address this. So welcome to the launch of this new campaign, Paul. Tell us more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I'll be very quick because the long and short of this is that the idea of this campaign is to use the fact that Raytheon, of Raytheon's extensive presence in Massachusetts and the fact that Raytheon is a major contractor for nuclear weapons to increase awareness that the growing danger of nuclear war is not just in Washington and Moscow, but lies at our doorstep here in Massachusetts. And then to use that awareness to help build a mobilization, a part of that mobilization to create a nuclear free world. So the idea here is to find out a way to give more visibility to the dangers of nuclear war and the need to abolish all of these weapons by using the fact of Raytheon's vast presence in Massachusetts and its production of these weapons, which you'll hear about later, uh, as the hook uh, to raise that awareness. Our, our activities will include all kinds of things, public actions, lobbying, public education outreach. Uh, we'll be challenging investment companies that control most of Raytheon's stock um, we'll consider divestment campaigns that, uh, that are operating in different parts of the country right now, counter recruiting campaigns, we'll hear a little bit about that later on. Uh, we'll kick off uh, our actions in this new campaign next Tuesday, August 30th at five o'clock uh, for those who are uh, from Massachusetts uh, along Fresh Pond Parkway outside of the Whole Foods big shopping plaza there uh, from five to 6 p.m. So. If you are around and can join us then, uh, that would be great to see you. We hope after you've heard tonight's presentations that you will consider getting involved in some way uh, in, this new in this new campaign. And um, Brian will be putting up a, uh, a link to a sign-up sheet if, uh, if after tonight's uh, presentations, you feel moved to, to get involved with us. Uh, hope you'll fill that, fill that uh, digital form that digital sign-up form out. So I think we're about uh, ready to go, Susan. Wonderful, okay. Uh, we have four wonderful speakers tonight and uh, we appreciate their joining us. Jackie Cabasso, 
will speak on the increasing danger of nuclear war and the role played by the trillion dollar nuclear modernization program in increasing that danger. Richard Krushnik, will speak of the nuclear weapons produced by Raytheon that play a key part in increasing the danger of nuclear war. Paul Shannon will tell us who Raytheon is beyond just a manufacturer of nuclear weapons and its influence over government policy and over many of our social institutions. And then Nick Rabb will speak about the connections between climate crisis and the coinciding crisis of militarism exemplified through nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Just to let you know, each speaker will present for eight to 10 minutes. Uh, we'll show a one minute video produced for this new campaign by MAPA's intern, Ethan Kroon. And our speakers, after our speakers, will break up into small groups uh, where we will um, brainstorm about ideas of what to do, what we might, what actions we might take. And this will be followed by an opportunity to share those ideas and to ask questions of our speakers. So uh, let's start first with Jackie. Jackie Cabasso, welcome. Uh, Jackie is the executive director of Western States Legal Foundation and serves as North American Coordinator of Mayors for Peace, a, an incredible organization. She was the 2008 recipient of the International Peace Bureau's Sean McBride Peace Award. She is currently attending the 10th Review Conference of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty at the United Nations headquarters in New York City. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you very much, Susan, and Massachusetts Peace Action and the Nuclear Disarmament Coordinating Committee. So I'm not an expert on Raytheon, but I have been asked to talk about the bigger role, nuclear weapon, the bigger nuclear weapons picture and provide some context for Raytheon's role. So first, let me start with some very basic stuff. Raytheon is not involved in the development and production of nuclear warheads, which is funded by the Department of Energy. Raytheon is very much involved in the development of delivery systems and missile defenses, which are funded by the Department of Defense. A nuclear weapon is a system requiring both a nuclear warhead and a delivery system. Let me say a little bit about the relationship between nuclear and conventional weapons. This is important to understanding the nature of arms racing and the dangers of nuclear escalation. The United States military encircles the globe through its operation of 11 unified combatant commands. Composed of forces from two or more armed services, the unified commands are headed by four-star generals and admirals who operate under the direct authority of the Secretary of Defense, accountable only to the president. Six of the commands are responsible for designated regions of the world and four others for various operations. When establishment of the U.S. Northern Command was announced in 2002, the official press release declared, quote, for the first time, commanders' areas of operation cover the entire Earth, end quote. The new Space Command was established in 2019. Tying all of the commands together is United States Strategic Command, or STRATCOM, at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. Following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, in 1992, President George H. Bush established STRATCOM, which for the first time brought the planning, targeting, and wartime employment of nuclear forces under the control of a single commander. Previously limited to nuclear weapons, STRATCOM's role was expanded consistent with pr provisions of the George W. Bush administration's 2001 Nuclear Posture Review, to encompass all aspects of assessing and responding to nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons worldwide. Nuclear weapons are not segregated either operationally or doctrinally for, from conventional weapons. This was not reversed in the subsequent nuclear post reviews in 2010 and 2018, and we're still waiting for the release of the unclassified 2022 nuclear post review. So I'd like to share my screen now. I just have one 
one slide that I want to share with you. And okay. Can you see that? Susan? It's coming. Yes. Okay. There it is. Great. Thank you. Okay. In describing the transition to a new strategic triad, the 2001 Nuclear Posture Review provides a useful tool for understanding how the U.S. plans to carry out its global warfighting strategy. In one corner of the new triad, new non-nuclear weapons capabilities have been added to the old Cold War strategic triad, consisting of submarine-based ballistic missiles, land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, and strategic bombers, all very much still here. This category was designated as offensive strike systems. The other legs of the new triad are defenses and a revitalized defense infrastructure that will provide new capabilities in a timely fashion to meet emerging threats, end quote. These three elements are bound together by, quote, enhanced command and control and intelligence systems. As military affairs analyst William Arkin warned at the time, tearing down the firewall that has separated nuclear weapons from other weapons lowers the threshold for US nuclear use. The three legs of the new strategic triad are designed to work together to enable the United States to project overwhelming military force. Considered in this context, it becomes easier to understand that so-called defenses are not really to defend the United States from a surprise attack. These layered systems include both national missile defense systems in the form of ground-based interceptors, initially in Alaska and California, and theater missile defenses deployed at foreign bases or on ships at sea, uh, notably in the current moment in Poland and Romania. New airborne missile defense technologies are in development. These missile defenses are intended to work together with the offensive weapon systems like swords and shields to protect US troops and bases and other so-called US strategic assets around the world. According to STRATCOM's official website, quote, the mission of US STRATCOM is to deter strategic attack and employ forces as directed to guarantee the security of our nation and our allies. The command enables joint force operations and is the combatant command responsible for strategic deterrence, nuclear operations, nuclear command control and communications, enterprise operations, joint electromagnetic spectrum operations, global strike, missile defense, analysis and targeting, and missile threat assessment. This dynamic command gives national leadership a unified resource for greater understanding of specific threats around the world and the means to respond to those threats rapidly, end quote. Uh, I have closed the slide, I think. No, stop Still sharing. There. Okay, there we go. There we okay. go. Sorry, now back to my text. So the nature of these interrelated operations brings home the complications of what is referred to as strategic stability, the intrinsic, sorry, uh, strategic stability, the intrinsic relationship between nuclear and conventional weapons. Russia has consistently called for inclusion of strategic stability in nuclear arms control discussions, while the US until now has mainly refused. In 2009, former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev warned that the pursuit of, quote, military superiority would be an insurmountable obstacle to ridding the world of nuclear weapons. Unless we discuss demilitarization of international politics, the reduction of military budgets, preventing militarization of outer space, talking about a nuclear free world will just be rhetorical, end quote. We're living in a time of extraordinary nuclear dangers with Russia's illegal war of aggression on Ukraine, which could eventually draw the militaries of the US, its NATO allies and Russia into direct conflict, Russia's repeated threats to use nuclear weapons and other festering nuclear flashpoints, including Taiwan, the Korean Peninsula and South Asia, the danger of nuclear war is as high as it's ever been. The scale and tempo of war games by nuclear armed states and their allies, including nuclear drills, is increasing. Ongoing missile tests and frequent close encounters between military forces of nuclear armed states, 
exacerbate nuclear dangers. Over the next 30 years, the United States plans to spend roughly $2 trillion to replace its entire nuclear weapons infrastructure and upgrade or replace its nuclear bombs and warheads and the bombers, missiles, and, and submarines that will deliver them. All nine nuclear armed nations are upgrading their nuclear arsenals. U.S. plans include a new air-launched cruise missile with long-range standoff capability that will be stealthier, more accurate, longer range, and deployed in the hundreds on a new stealth bomber, the B-2. A new land-based intercontinental ballistic missile, euphemistically called the ground-based nuclear deterrent, with an enhanced W-81-7 warhead to replace the 400 Minuteman III missiles currently deployed on the Great Plains and 12 new replacement Trident ballistic missile submarines. Trident sub submarine launched ballistic missiles are undergoing life extensions and the mated W-76-1 warhead has been made much more accurate. An entirely new warhead, the W-93, is planned for deployment by 2040. Other speakers will explain in more detail. Raytheon has a piece in all of these. Last February, warning that the danger of nuclear war with Russia or China is, quote, a very real possibility, Admiral Charles Richard, head of U.S. Strategic Command, I remind you, in charge of integrated nuclear and conventional war planning, explained the coercive role of nuclear weapons in U.S. war fighting plans, quote, we must acknowledge the foundational nature of our nation's strategic nuclear forces as they create the maneuver space for us to project conventional military power strategically, end quote. And I ask, how is this different from Russia's use of nuclear threats to limit U.S. and NATO military involvement in Ukraine? Russian President Vladimir Putin, in a 2018 speech, boasted about new invincible nuclear Russian nuclear weapons and gave a detailed description, complete with video animations, of an array of new nuclear weapons delivery systems, including a nuclear-powered cruise missile and an underwater drone. In September 2020, the Pentagon claimed that China plans to double its stockpile of nuclear warheads from 290 in this decade, including those designed to be carried by ballistic missiles that can reach the United States. In 2021, France announced plans to launch the full-scale development phase of a new program to build France's third-generation nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. The French Minister for the Armed Forces described the new nuclear submarine as, quote, a program that fully embodies the long term of our defense. The first third-generation ballistic missile submarine will be delivered in 2035, followed by one submarine every five years. And these will sail until, 19, until 2090. In other words, this is still part of the quote, the last sailors who patrol on board the third generation ballistic missile submarines are not born yet. And in 2021, Prime Minister Boris Johnson released an integrated defense review that calls for increasing the UK's nuclear stockpile ceiling from the earliest earlier goal of 180 by the mid 2020s to as many as 260, a 44% increase. The defense review vaguely justifies the increase in the nuclear warheads cap, quote, in recognition of the evolving security environment, end quote, and in response to a, quote, developing range of technological and doctrinal threats, end quote. All of these developments violate the nuclear disarmament requirements of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which entered into force in 1970. Finally, I want to offer a cautionary note about our approach to the war economy. We need to always keep in mind that militarism and the military budget are about more than just military spending and guns versus butter. We also need to pay attention to the purposes and interests that militarism serve and how perpetual war preparations underscore a culture of violence that runs from the top to the bottom of our society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie, for showing us and, and pointing out the dangers of nuclear weapons and uh, the, the danger of nuclear war, whether these weapons be used intentionally or by accident and the relationship um, between our weapons and our system and our government. Uh, next on to 
Richard Krushnick. Richard Krushnick is a longtime researcher of military production and imperial US foreign policy and overt covert warfare. He is also a professional in public financing of community economic development in the US and Latin America. Richard. I'd like to pick up uh, uh, where uh, Jackie sort of left off. I hope you got what I consider to be the main point uh, of her talk, which was that uh, conventional warfare and nuclear warfare has become integrated. That means they both, are, they, they have all kinds of plans for how they can happen at the same time. That's what integrating them means. Uh, now that's different than where we were in the 1960s and first part of the 1970s, if not all of the 1970s, when we really did have mad mutual assured destruction. Yes, there were some uh, intermediate range nuclear weapons. There was some kind of provisions for uh, battlefield use of nuclear weapons, but it was quite limited. They were quite inaccurate. Uh, and uh, what the real name of the game was, was the strategic nuclear weapons, the air, air launched ones, the submarine launched ones, and the missile silo ones that Jackie mentioned, the strategic triad. And the warheads on those missiles were uh, 20 and 30 times the size of the blast of the Hiroshima bomb. Now let that soak in for a moment if you're not familiar with it, right? You know what the Hiroshima bomb could do to a city. Think of bombs 20 and 30 times uh, larger blasts than that. Those were the predominant missiles in the strategic triad. They didn't know at the time, but if there had been a nuclear war using those weapons, there would have been a nuclear winter on the earth that would have killed a quarter to a half of the population. Even if the only targets other than military, you know, missile silos and airplane bases and things like that, even if they just attacked command and control centers that are often in or near cities, it would have produced enough combustible material to put enough soot in the, soot in the air to cut agricultural production in half for a decade or so. They didn't really know that at the time, but that was the true danger we were under. And those missiles were inaccurate. They had circle, uh, circular error probables, meaning half the missiles warheads would land within 300 yards or 400 yards of the target. So that's why they needed these super giant warheads to be able to take out a missile silo because they were so inaccurate. Now, the most important thing I would like to convey to you, and this is further information on the context in which Raytheon's work is going on now, is that we're in a totally different world now. The new generation of nuclear weapons that is under construction right now doesn't have uh, you know, it's not focused on these giant warheads. It's focused on warheads that vary from 145th the size of the Hiroshima bomb to 13 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. And there's three warheads that are manipulable, dialable warheads, where depending on the use on the battlefield that you want to make of them, they can have a small blast, a large blast, a medium-sized blast. And the accuracy is not 300 or 400 yards anymore. It's 10 to 30 yards. So you can take out, you know, when you cut the distance by half, you increase the effectiveness of the weapon by eight times by the, squ by the square, by, uh, by three times. Uh, and, uh, so we have the new generation of nuclear weapons that's under construction can be integrated into battlefield war fighting because 
they have such heavily increased accuracy and all kinds of dialable blast sizes, depending on the target you want to take out. My estimation, if we get into a nuclear war, it's going to start with somebody using one or two battlefield nuclear weapons to take out specific military bases, things like that, under the gamble that it's small enough that it's not going to produce uh, escalation to uh, all-out nuclear war. Unfortunately, uh, at least uh, on the Pentagon side, every single war fighting game that's been done so far uh, using these smaller battlefield, super accurate nuclear weapons has always escalated into nearly an all out nuclear conflict. So the true danger, what, the reason why William Perry, former Secretary of Defense, Sam Nunn, the longest standing uh, head of the Senate Armed Services Committee, tell us that we are in far more danger of nuclear war now than we ever were, ever were, is because of the nature of the design of the new generation of nuclear weapons and how it is specifically designed for use on the battlefield. No longer mutual assured destruction while each side is afraid to pull the trigger because it definitely means destruction of both sides. Now there's this notion that a side can start a nuclear war and somehow not result in global nuclear confrontation and, and uh, nuclear winter. Now, Sam Nunn and William Perry pointed out specifically the danger of Raytheon's new long range nuclear air launched missile. They won the contract for design of the missile, a couple billion dollars. They're in line to get the production contract when that happens, another 20 or $30 billion. Uh, there is a, a long range nuclear missile currently flying in US airplanes that's being retired and will be replaced by the new Raytheon one. The new Raytheon is a big deal because it has all kinds of features that the previous one didn't. It has all kinds of evasive maneuvers, decoys, uh, you know, electromagnetic hardening, uh, all kinds of features that supposedly can overcome uh, enemy air defenses. Uh, and uh, another aspect that's important to understand is that since the new generation of nuclear weapons is designed for nuclear war fighting. That means the U.S. is far more considering, as is Russia. That's why they've threatened it. Russia has threatened it in the Ukraine situation because they think that they have some shot at starting a war and getting away with it. Now, the U.S. is still pursuing the chimera of a first strike, which might be a strategic first strike. And so they're trying to develop anti-missile missiles capable of shooting down a Soviet response. Same thing happens at the battlefield level. The US is developing missiles designed to shoot down short range and intermediate range nuclear weapons. Raytheon's SM-3 is the most widely deployed anti-missile missile in the world and reputedly, according to the Pentagon, the most successful. It supposedly had 30 successful takedowns in tests of, uh, in, of uh, short range and intermediate range nuclear missiles and one successful takedown test of an intercontinental ballistic uh, missile. And uh, it's also a modification of it is being done by Raytheon it's one of the two that are advancing in the U.S. to be used against the new generation of hypersonic nuclear missiles, which travel at five times the speed of sound. Uh, so this missile uh, is deployed on uh, all of our, sub uh, not every one of them, but on nuclear submarines, attack submarines, on naval surface ships, the uh, Aegis cruisers, it's deployed all over Europe. This is Raytheon's SM-3 anti-missile missile. 
It's also operational right now in Romania, and it's supposed to be operational in Poland later this year. Raytheon's uh, Tomahawk cruise missile, which many of you have heard a lot about, there's been somewhere between four and 5,000 of them produced. They've been used extremely widely in all of the recent U US wars. Um, <clears throat> they have, uh, you know, uh, they can be fitted with nuclear tips. Uh, in fact, they were, and they were flying in U.S. airplanes with about a thousand mile range and, you know, ground hugging flight that's very hard to detect or shoot down. And until Obama uh, removed them from active service in 2012, we are told now that there are no, thank you, there are no uh, tomahawks in use right now, uh, but the new Guinea and Poland they can easily sneak in nuclear tip Tomahawk missiles, which would be 10 minutes from Moscow, for example. And these missiles can carry these, any, any of these variable dialable warheads, uh, which, make, which makes it very frightening. Uh, Raytheon also uh, is extending the life of the Trident nuclear submarine guidance systems. It's the leading contractor for all nuclear war, war fighting communications from command and control in central US to all the systems that would actually fire nuclear weapons in the field, the internal communications within the weapons themselves and how they communicate with th those who could fire them. Raytheon is the key communications contractor and will undoubtedly be so on the new land-based missile uh, that's under development. Uh, so Raytheon is involved in all aspects, strategic and tactical, and uh, they are reputedly the most successful lobbyist in recent years. Remember, they've had their lobbyist be the Secretary of Defense to re be replaced by the current Secretary of Defense, Raytheon, on the Raytheon board. They had the assistant secretary of defense, which succeeded in getting more of the Raytheon bombs for Yemen when that was being contested. Uh, so uh, back to the original point we started with, or, or the point that you're gonna see in the video, is war for real strategic interests or is war just for military company profits? Uh, well, Raytheon lobbyists are a good argument for the latter interpretation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. I, and uh, I know that there are lots of questions and we'll have time later for questions and comments. Uh, that goes right into our next speaker, Paul Shannon, who is uh, chairs the Raytheon committee, the Raytheon campaign in mass peace action. Paul Shannon worked for the American Friends Service Committee for 40 years and is currently a coordinator in the Raytheon anti-war campaign. Paul. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, that's a pretty scary talk we just heard. <laughs> um, but I wanna ask the question, who is this Raytheon? Raytheon Technologies, is its official name now, is the second largest military contractor on Earth with $64 billion a year in net sales. It employs 174,000 people around the world. It is in the top three arms supplier to countries around the world, selling its weapons to numerous countries, dozens of them. It has close relations with a number of the countries such as Saudi Arabia, where it owns its own subsidiary in Riyadh and where it employs 400 people working for the Saudi government and it trains the Saudi military. That's just in Saudi Arabia. And Raytheon is by far the largest military contractor in Massachusetts. So it's clear that Raytheon is, the heart, is at the heart of the military industrial complex. We will see that Raytheon is also at the heart of the deep state 
And it turns out Raytheon is at the heart of our own lives. Uh, there are a number of ways, if we focus just on government, that Raytheon gets its way. As Richard mentioned, two of the last secretaries of defense, Esper and Austin, were right out of uh, Raytheon management. Austin was a director of the company on the board of directors, uh, and Esper was Raytheon's top lobbyist. They followed in the steps of other Raytheon uh, government officials, but they did an especially good job for the company. Esper worked very, very hard with Raytheon's, one of Raytheon's lobbying firms to kill an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act a few years ago that would have ended US war in Yemen. Esper made sure that it continued. Raytheon has received a pile of new contracts under both Esper and Austin. Austin himself sits on the board of other industries connected to war corporations. And President Biden's administration is stacked with people who come out of consulting groups and think tanks that service war contractors. The second connection that Raytheon has to government is through hiring officials to smooth the way for new contracts. Raytheon a year ago employed 315 former defense officials, more than any other defense contractor. These are people who worked for the, for the uh, Pentagon and when they retire, they move right over to work for Raytheon. But what's a very interesting uh, fact right now given what's going on in the country, is that Raytheon, of course, like other companies, finances congressional campaigns. Raytheon had given $400,000 to Republican lawmakers who refused to certify the election results on January 6, 2021. Raytheon ranks as the fourth largest donor to Republican lawmakers who voted to overturn the election. In other words, Raytheon, for instance, supports the campaigns of 62 members of Congress who decided that President Biden was not the president and that the election should not be certified. In other words, Raytheon is supporting the campaigns of some of the most dangerous men and women on the planet. And Raytheon also gave $506,000 in donations to President Biden's presidential campaign. The next connection where Raytheon gets what it wants is of course through lobbying. Back in 2018, Raytheon spent $4.4 million hiring uh, lobbyists. Last year, it spent $12.7 million on federal lobbying more than any other defense contractor. And we're talking about numerous lobbying firms, a dozen or more that they hire. Raytheon, of course, is like other big companies, is involved in government advisory boards. The, bo the group of people that advised Biden when he first came into office, these 13 people to advising him on foreign policy, two of those 13 were employees of Raytheon. And finally, uh, Raytheon funds think tanks to develop war policies and provide experts for the media, uh, such as the very influential Center for a New American Security. Sounds very nice. Uh, and you'll hear pundits from that group speaking from time to time, telling you why we have to do this or do that. Um, those, those think tanks are funded by Raytheon. Raytheon is so enmeshed with government that you cannot draw a line between where Raytheon ends and the Defense Department and US Congress begin. The end result, of course, is an $850 billion military budget and a nuclear arms race. That's $850 billion worth of new fossil fuel emissions 
to be created by the biggest single source of carbon pollution on earth, our war machine. And what, all, what Raytheon also gets is the expansion of NATO. In 1997, the New York Times carried a very important article. This is back in 1997 when decisions were still being made about expanding NATO to Russia's borders. The arms industry provided much of the backbone, much of the lobbying, much of the pressure, much of the money to make sure that NATO expanded and that other ideas for security in Europe were not listened to. Raytheon, of course, is banking on this new Cold War with China for new contracts. For instance, the chairman of the board of Raytheon, Greg Hayes, has said that China's military technology is the most stabilizing, stabilize, destabilizing threat to the homeland. The time to react is very, very short. Of course, China's military budget is one quarter of ours. Raytheon, the United States spends 53% of all nuclear war spending in the world. China spends 14% and Russia 10%. And yet somehow Russia and China are surging ahead of us requiring the production of new weapons that Raytheon will make. So those are connections to government. These are things that we kind of generally know, but getting into the specifics is, is pretty important, I think. However, and I, I, I'm, I don't want to go over my time here. Susan, do I have another minute? Yes, you do. Okay, great. If we look at media, as I said, Raytheon's think tanks provide pundits to be interviewed uh, on the media uh, so that we get this incredible media bias in favor of increasing military uh, budgets, dangers of war, and, and the, whole, the whole works. Education, Raytheon is developing a pipeline to colleges so that college, so even, even going far back as, as uh, high schools, providing scholarships, um, forgiveness of loans, college loans that people have taken out to go to college. Raytheon will help you get rid of those if you get into one of these pipelines on, the, on your way to employment uh, at Raytheon. Don't have time to go into all the uh, specifics of this, but it is quite extensive. Raytheon runs a number of science programs in, in uh, grammar schools around the country. It's a, the other area that focus on, so education in colleges are tremendously impacted by war corporations, including, including Raytheon. And they've spent a tremendous amount of effort uh, building those pipelines from those, from those institutions. And, um, you know, through, through a whole bunch of different means, they, they sp are focusing especially now on black colleges and providing scholarships, funding to those colleges uh, to develop uh, future employees of, of these war companies coming out of these colleges. And Raytheon is, is right in on this. I'll just close by saying, but we, we the, the whole education piece is huge. And I think we'll have another webinar sometime just on that. So we understand what's happening to our education system and it's how it's being shaped by the money, the tremendous amounts of money that Raytheon and the others have. I'll just mention the last thing is the world of nonprofits. Raytheon is the lead sponsor for the Walk for Hunger in Boston. Raytheon is a major funder of the National Urban League. Raytheon is a major funder of the Girl Scouts, National Girl Scouts. It is a major funder of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. It is a major funder of the Equal Justice Initiative. It is, an, it is a major, it is the main sponsor of the run for home base at Fenway Park that happens every year and for boys and girls clubs. One minute. And, the list, and the list goes on and on. Uh, 30 seconds, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. 
Let, well, let, let me just close with this, Susan. The frightening thing is that Raytheon, all Lockheed, and one of them is all around us. But what that does is it gives us handles that we can use to educate people and go after and go after these nonprofits and ask them to do what they can to get these war companies to back off and to tra to transfer their production into useful production for the country, especially in the area of climate change. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much for that last bit, Paul, uh, and for all your work on this. Now let's go to a video that Ethan Kroon put together for this launch of this campaign. And this is the premiere of this video. You are here at the premiere. <laughs> and send it out to everybody we know, right? Okay. All right, give me one second here. Forget the Leaving office in 1961, leaving office in 1961, President Eisenhower warned of the establishment of what he called a military-industrial complex. Defense contractors like Raytheon have become powerful special interests with influence in the government. The defense lobby has grown so powerful that we no longer create weapons for war. We create war for weapons. Here's a quick rundown. In 2021, Raytheon spent over $15.3 million lobbying Congress. These lobbying efforts secure and close foreign weapons deals that lead to the distribution of more and more weapons contracts stateside and to the development of more and more devastating and dangerous weapons. While conventional wisdom in Washington dictates that these weapons sales make America and by extension the world a safer place, in reality these sales serve only to cushion the pockets of Raytheon and other defense contractors shareholders, 51 of which are members of Congress, writing our laws and determining our defense budget. War is made for weapons, not the other way around. With Raytheon's quarterly profits placed above the well-being of human life, especially that of foreign citizens, defense lobbying doesn't just influence arm deals, but the very conflicts that these arms are used in and supposedly built for. Because if all you have is a hammer, everything is going to look like a nail. And if all you have are weapons, the only way to stop a conflict is through violence. Thank you very much, Ethan. Okay, Ethan's uh, his video, nice shot and to the point to say the least. Uh, let me introduce our final presenter on our panel tonight. Uh, Nick Rabb is a member of MAPA's Peace and Climate Working Group, uh, which tries to draw the connections between the climate crisis and, and the dangers of nuclear war, as well as militarism in general. And he's a PhD candidate in computer science and cognitive science at Tufts University. It's good to know we have someone studying that stuff. <laughs> uh, a uh, I will just mention that uh, at Tufts University this past uh, spring, Nick organized fellow students uh, to disrupt recruitment events hosted by General Dynamics and by Raytheon, and is working to grow an anti-militarist presence on campus. His work is motivated by the belief that the climate crisis and militarism are fundamentally linked. So organizing against both is essential to securing a future for life on our planet. Thanks for joining us tonight, Nick. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so um, I think, Honestly, more and more people are growing more aware all the time that there are many connections between the climate crisis and the U.S. empire's military apparatus. Some of them were already mentioned. Right For one, the Pentagon is the largest institutional polluter on the planet. Uh, their war games also pollute land across the world, destroy ecosystems, force people out of their homes, only to repress them when they come uh, to the U.S. to try to migrate. But U.S. militarism is, is even more deeply connected to the climate crisis in ways that I think are not as much discussed yet, but are coming. Uh, the dominating systems 
that U.S. militarism spawns things like uh, media propaganda, right, necessary to justify wars, uh, the military industrial complex to make the means of going to war or the police to, to smack people down if they you know, get too uppity, uh, are actively at play, attempting to maintain the power, for example, of the fossil fuel industry at all costs. I've seen this in my work in the climate movement where you know, pipeline protests are brutally repressed by police. Right? The military works across the world to secure resources needed for global capitalism, destroying the environment in the process, um, and its industrial arm lobbies the government to lavishly fund war instead of putting money towards transforming society and averting climate catastrophe. Now, you know, this is really nothing new. This is kind of the DNA of the U.S., right? It's, it's really a legacy born from a history of colonialism and racial capitalism. These are all militarized systems that are in place to fundamentally allow the powerful to steal land and resources from us. And if we fight back, they crush us, right? And as the one thing that really concerns me and keeps me uh, up uh, at night and during the day is that as the climate crisis continues and worsens, uh, the temptation by states and their capitalist partners to deal with the problems of the climate crisis with continued and increased domination will grow. And this is all, this is all exemplified in the production of nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. So as we heard already, the, new, the U.S. uses nuclear weapons to bully other nations into doing what they want, playing an extremely dangerous game with weapons that could end society in a flash. Nuclear weapons in the climate crisis are sometimes called twin existential threats, but they're both born of runaway capitalism and imperialism. You know, even if nuclear weapons usage didn't instantly lead to social collapse, right? The effect of such weapons are devastating to the environment and the people around as exemplified by Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Someone in the chat even mentioned uh, things like depleted uranium munitions that are used in Iraq and caused widespread birth defects in the population. Uh, and protest against nuclear weapons, if you protest hard enough, is similarly met with repression from these dominating systems, uh, with courageous activists right, receiving lengthy prison sentences for demonstrating against civilization-ending technology. And the same is true for nuclear power, right, which is being pushed as a profitable solution to the climate crisis. But nuclear power has similar issues. right? It pollutes the environment with waste. Uh, it employs deplorable work conditions, mining nuclear materials often put on indigenous people in their communities. It risks catastrophic consequences in the risk uh, in the case of a nuclear accident and simultaneously develops the capabilities for nuclear weapons. Right? Moreover, there are billions and billions of dollars spent on nuclear weapons while renewable energy, public transit, housing, food security, and efforts to shift to a sustainable society are severely underfunded, as we know. Uh, for example, in the 2015 federal budget, military spending was more than 15 times percent, uh, 15 times that uh, for energy and environment. But that's even a trick because even inside that budget for energy and environment through the Department of Energy, 62% of that was for nuclear weapons. So it's a pittance for renewable energy and for things that would make our world more livable. And while all of this militarization happens, right, while the powerful double down in the face of losing their power, our culture, Jackie mentioned this, our culture becomes more and more dominating as a result, justifying unspeakable violence and complicity in it as just something that's normal. And the climate crisis, in my opinion, is continuing to get worse, and a social transition continues to be opposed directly because of the mobilization of dominating systems to maintain the status quo. And, you know, as, as we all know, there are so many contributors to the problem, um, but these big five military industrial complex companies, including Raytheon, are an enormous part of both like this, this joint climate crisis and the crisis of militarization and domination. For one, right, it's easy to say their bombs directly pollute and destroy the land that we have to live on. They force mass migration and kick people out of their homes. Their factories and jets pollute our air and water. 
and their ideology pollutes our minds, right? leading to people justifying extraction and murder on a wide scale that becomes hidden behind their paychecks and their coworkers who rationalize their complicity in crimes. And, and Paul mentioned this uh, sort of in the intro. I wanted to talk about this because I've seen sort of the influence, that last part, the, their ideology polluting our minds. I've seen that in my university at Tufts. I'm a computer science student, which means I'm in the School of Engineering. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of aware all the time of uh, the thought processes that go on in my fellow students as they go through sort of the university system, particularly at um, Tufts University, which is supposedly some kind of prestigious institution where people learn to become employees of these companies. Um, and at Tufts, the School of Engineering regularly brings Raytheon recruiters to campus. Um, and I wanted to elaborate too on something that Paul said that military industrial complex companies purposely recruit young people, especially uh, my, minoritized young people, black students, indigenous students, students of color generally, because they know that a lot of them are embedded and want chances to advance socially because of the other screwed up systems in our, uh, in our society. Just as one example, a 2017 Department of Defense report Four of the top 10 reasons they, uh, that were given when they pulled young people asking uh, if, if and why they would join the military, four of the top 10 reasons were to pay for education or to try to socially advance. Um, and in 2019, uh, some army general, General Frank Muth, was quoted saying, quote, uh, the low unemployment rate and booming economy makes recruitment difficult especially when compared to past recruiting pushes during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars that lined up closer to a major recession, end quote. So this is for the military generally, but the same thing is true for military industrial complex companies. I can't tell you how many you know, friends and colleagues and fellow students I've heard um, you know, say that they take jobs at these companies because they need to pay off massive debts and they need to support their families. Um, and, and Raytheon is no different. Raytheon has had a long partnership with Tufts. This was founded by two former Tufts alumni and the chairman of the Raytheon board served on the Tufts board of trustees for something like 20 years through the 70s and 80s. Tufts promotes internships that students have had. Thanks, Susan. Uh, they promote internships that students had with Raytheon and invite their propagandists to come to campus, but they don't mention you know, all of the crimes. Right? They don't mention their complicity um, and what Paul was mentioning, how I helped organize students around this, this is what we wanted to call out on campus. So we, we went into one of their meetings and asked them pointed questions about uh, why in their presentation they weren't talking about how their weapons are used for murder. Uh, and, you know, they had a canned answer where they said like, oh, our, our technology keeps soldiers safe. When I kept pressing, they got pretty angry uh, and called campus police on me to escort me out of the presentation. Um, I left voluntarily because I didn't want to be picked out by the police. Um, but then after that, I was approached by a campus police officer who told me that um, my financial aid may be taken away if the School of Engineering gets angry enough about our questioning of military recruiters. Uh, and this came on the heels of, of as Paul said, um, our disruption of a general dynamics recruitment event as well. Uh, so they were definitely mad. Um, and if I have like 30 seconds, I just want to say quickly, a couple key things that I learned that I think are really important for this campaign. The one being that on campuses, the recruiters rely on students being quiet and not standing up. But once you do stand up, they have no legs to stand on, right? Their arguments are so bad. But second, some of the propaganda that they put out is unfortunately effective because many of the engineering students at the event uh, were not fans of our questioning, saying that we were jeopardizing their chances to get profitable internships. So we have a long way to go with STEM students, but on the other hand, many non-STEM students were huge fans of our actions. And there was an enormous buzz around campus. We were featured in the school paper twice and it trended online. Uh, and third, these companies rely on their partnerships with the universities. So disrupting them is a huge blow to this sort of recruitment and legitimacy pipeline of companies like Raytheon. Um, so I just wanna conclude by saying, you know, young people and students these days, as I see it, are widely immersing themselves in anti-racist, anti-imperial and anti-colonial reading and study. And in the wake of, you know, racial justice uprisings and the worsening climate crisis, there are so many young people 
We're seeing that US militarism is to blame for why our world is so backwards and they are ready to be organized and can be a huge, huge asset to the movement. Thank you very much, Nick, <laughs> incredible. You bring us into action. Uh, Paul, do you wanna tell people about our actions? And then we'll break out into groups. Well, I just want to mention that uh, I, Brian has put the link in the in the uh, in the chat, but uh, hoping people will sign up to to participate in the in the campaign in a way that is appropriate for you. The more people we get, the more things we can do. Uh, we don't need people to commit full time by any means, but we need people to be willing to to show up when you can, to make that phone call when you can, et cetera, and we can kind of build this campaign to. Raise, a, raise the visibility of the danger of nuclear war and raise the, the need for us all to get to get active and, and to, to take this on. But I think now we wanna go into uh, small groups, Susan. Right, we're gonna break up into small groups for about five minutes, that's why they're small, to brainstorm about ideas uh, we have for the campaign, ideas you may have. And I know there are lots of questions for these wonderful speakers that we've had that will come after the five minutes we'll come back to the room so brian can you put us into small groups please and then just make sure you come back okay that should put everybody into rooms you do have to join uh, but it will give you an invite and then it'll say you'll have 15 minutes but i'll bring you back in about five minutes
So I guess it is pretty much everyone back here. Well, that's amazing. We still have 56 people hanging in there. Um, not, not an easy topic to deal with and not an easy problem to solve. Um, so we're going to just open it up now for um, ideas anybody came up with in their small groups or just questions you have for any of the speakers. Uh, it's just kind of a free for all now, but what we will do is ask people if you have a question or if you want to just kind of share a little bit what came out of the of your small group or, or any idea you have about how to proceed with this campaign, um, just use the reactions um, icon at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. Uh, and if all goes well, when you raise your hand, we'll see you, we'll call on you, and uh, Brian will unmute you so that you can ask your, your question. Uh, so this, I see a bunch of hands. This is great. Uh, let's start with, uh, in my upper left-hand corner, I don't know if it's yours, with uh, John McDougall. John, uh, could you, can we unmute John? There we go. I think I'm unmuted. Okay, if I may, well, thanks so much to all the speakers. Um, and uh, two questions that may or may not be related. Question number one, I'm always shocked how Congress people who are liberal, and this includes, of course, the recent vote on uh, weapons to Ukraine, uh, end up supporting contract military contracts in their own district, um, and how to somehow under knock away the props that support that. And that brings me to a question for any panelist who wants to talk about maybe very specific and achievable actions that can be done. Thank you so much, Nick, for what you said about and for your work at Tufts. That may be one achievable thing that could be done on many campuses, including, I guess, high schools. Anyway, um, Congress and specific achievable next steps. Two questions, if you would. Any, any of the panelists want to take that on quickly? I didn't really hear well enough uh, to really grasp the question. I didn't either. Want to just ask it very quickly, John? Yeah, so one thing is how to somehow stop the situation where, you know, Congress people love to, at least they're willing to support military contractors in their own district, even though they're progressive Congress people. That's number one. And number two, specific actions for example, by young people that can be done and produce hopefully a sense of achievement of something specific, say in the next two or three years. Okay, let's, uh, if any of the panelists want to take that on. Well, I think I just mentioned, I think one thing is we should start thinking about hooking up with, with uh, students at the colleges. Uh, where some of this stuff is happening and see if they are interested in uh, in expanding some of the the work the good work they're doing to include uh, this issue uh, by us kind of raising the issue and making it more visible um, by letting them know that Raytheon is right next door to us and they're heavily involved in this which means all of us are heavily involved too uh, that's that's pretty simplistic but uh, let's keep that question in mind, those two questions in mind that John is, is asking, and let's take the next uh, comment or question from uh, uh, Ben Gordon. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, I work with a number of groups here, I'm mainly with Pax Christi USA, but um, uh, I also work with War Resisters Leading Veterans for Peace, and uh, we do, uh, what well, we do, actions around here. Uh, we have um, rallies on, on corners where we hand out literature to folks at heavy traffic corners. And then other times we lo lobby our Congress people, both mainly on the federal level for the anti-war stuff. Um, and there's a lot of different groups out there besides those, Code Pink, as you all, plus MAPA and others. So, uh, uh, but this presentation, let me end by saying this presentation today uh, from different aspects of the struggle uh, against war was really good. Uh, all, pre all presenters were excellent and thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks very much. Um, 
So there's a lot going on, as Ben mentioned, not not necessarily very visible, but there's a lot going on to build on. Uh, let's take uh, Jack Cohen Japa uh, next. Jack has uh, done a lot of this work against Raytheon out in Tucson on Raytheon's nuclear weapons. Jack, you have a comment or you want to, uh, you got to unmute yourself. There we are. There we yeah. go. Um, since they're building the LRSO, that long range standoff missile here in Tucson, I'd like a good capsule summary of its alleged strategic value over any other nuclear weapon carried by a long range bomber. How's that? I'd be glad to respond. Uh, supposedly the LRSO uh, the advantage that it ha has over the existing cruise nuclear tip cruise missile that is aloft in our skies right now is that unlike the existing one, uh, it, ha it has uh, various evasive capabilities, uh, various masking and decoy capabilities that the other one does not have. It has much more hardened electronics uh, and much more resistance to electronic pulse. So it's supposed, supposedly uh, way, way more su survivable uh, against any uh, anti-missile missiles or other uh, electromagnetic techniques uh, meant to you know, divert it or destroy it from its mission. And that's basically its uh, purported strategic advantage over the existing generation. Okay, well, thanks Thank Richard, pretty, pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> let's take uh, Stephanie Hiller. Hi everyone, thank you for this great presentation. Um, I'm wondering about coalition building uh, and what people think about the effort it might take. I think Code Pink has been trying to do this quite a bit is, join forces. And it seems like if we need a big movement and we need it now, um, would it be uh, expedient and worthwhile to spend the time trying to just hook up with every peace group on, the, you know, um, at least in this country, but maybe even I was going to say on the planet. Anyhow, I'm just putting that out to the experts here. Could I, could I throw out a quick comment to that? If possible, yeah. I think that's I think that's absolutely the right instinct, Stephanie. Actually, a group of us who in in peace action in the Northeast, uh, who all met up this past weekend, discussed um, sort of this idea of um, reading the political landscape as it is today and seeing the need for like massive coalitions of left leaning organizations, uh, where people in the peace movement see the need to support climate, see the need to support racial justice or indigenous sovereignty. I think these things are absolutely necessary. And that's probably one of the only ways we can start to grow our power to achieve the fights that we want. Uh, and I'd, I'd wonder too, what, you know, just to plant some seeds in everyone's minds, what you all think of sort of, you know, when we're building these coalitions to, um, you know, really, really read up and learn about other people's issues so we're genuinely showing up for them so that when we have moments they genuinely show up for us and how do we build those deep relationships that are really really you know rooted in us not just joining with them for the sake of urgency or for the sake of um, sort of a shallow power building but a really deep community building which maybe unfortunately paradoxically is a little antithetical to urgency which is something tough in my mind, but food for thought. Can, can I follow up on that? Sure, yeah. go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, so I totally agree with every word you said. And I wanna put in a plug for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Um, the Poor People's Campaign has picked up Martin Luther King's unfinished work and has identified five interlocking injustices that are inseparable addressing systemic poverty, systemic racism, environmental devastation, the military, uh, militarism and the war economy, 
and a distorted religious moral narrative, which blames poor people for being poor rather than seeing it as a systemic problem. And these things are seen as five indivisible interlocking injustices that comprise the basis of one moral fusion campaign. And it has, you know, it aspires to be a movement. I don't think it is a movement yet, but I think we need a movement because we absolutely cannot win on any one of these pressing issues as single issues. And we need to find a way to come together to work across common values, to be there, as Nick said, to substantially, not just superficially, support each other while pursuing our own priorities and building the relationships that will draw other constituencies to support ours. And I really see this as being the best hope that's out there now. And it has a lot of support from very diverse constituencies, including major trade unions, faith-based organizations, environmental organizations, peace and justice organizations, environmental justice, and so on and so forth. So I just wanna put in a plug. And if you have not familiarized yourself with the Poor People's Campaign, take a look on the website, poorpeoplescampaign.org, look at the Moral Budget and the Moral Jubilee platform, where you'll see that they are calling for a 50% cut in the military budget, closing 60% of US foreign military bases, close, ending all US foreign wars and um, uh, eliminating and uh, defunding and actually, um, What's the word that I'm looking for here, but actually eliminating nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And I'd uh, like to highlight the uh, excellent nuclear posture review recently produced by Veterans for Peace. Yeah. Uh, that's a great contribution to the effort. Uh, and uh, I think so far, at least for MAPA, uh, to the extent that there's been success, it's been uh, with students on campus. And it's been with nurses uh, unions uh, and teachers unions. And uh, we need volunteers who, who are familiar with these respective fields uh, who would like to kind of take charge and work on improving communications uh, with teachers and with nurses and uh, other medical professionals and medical associations teachers associations, education associations. Uh, if we would could get more volunteers willing to uh, supplement that kind of work, that would go a long way. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Just mentioned that uh, MAPA is heavily involved in the Poor People's Campaign. Jonathan King, who's on the call right now, uh, is seems to be working pretty much full time on it. And uh, MAPA can easily plug people into it because there's a lot of work that has to be done uh, before the elections. Um, let's take, uh, see if we can get a few more questions in. Robert Walker. Uh, wait a second. Can, 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 yes, I'm but, Robert Walker. I'm uh, participating from Canada, but my ancestors became uh, American and Methodist. In 1673, four, we carried out a, a genocidal war against the indigenous people of New England. And in Canada, a big factor for peace is our own truth and reconciliation processes taking place here. So I, I think making connections with the indigenous people uh, and seeking their advice and guidance in terms of the, the ways to approach a peaceful resolution of conflict uh, may, may be helpful to your organization and actions. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Robert. Uh, let's go on to uh, if people can stay with us for five more minutes. Uh, we're, we're, we're really stretching it out here. Uh, but let's take Chris, Chris Fanzica. Chris, can you unmute? Oh, I thought you were going to unmute me. Sorry. Um, oh. Yeah. So Chris Panzica with uh, MAPA and the um, Raytheon group. And now also it's the Raytheon and uh, Nuclear Disarmament Group. So in our those, those, uh, those of you who were at the very first one, someone had the idea of billboard. Okay. And that sounds prohibitive, right? 
Um, but there's these things called blip billboards and there are a few of them in Boston and the prices are ridiculously low. Um, I don't know if you, want, if you want me to throw that out there now, but um, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we need that. We need ideas, Chris. Yeah. So Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like I say, it's like for $20 a day, you can get uh, 292 blips in, in a mix of off, you know, off peak and peak. Uh, if you go for the peak, peak times of the day, I guess you get 527 blips per day. So you get a couple of blips there. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I just thought maybe it would be a, something to explore, uh, given, especially given that it doesn't cost much. Wait, These well, are blips on electronic billboards on highways? Yeah, or? yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Great well, idea. So let's talk about that at our next meeting, Chris. Yeah, I'll um, do a little bit more research. During, I just created an account <laughs> while okay. we were. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, Trish Gallagher, uh, Trish, you still uh, you got to unmute yourself. Oh, you can't. Okay, time to pass. Okay, let's go to uh, uh, John King and then Michael Hoey, and I think we'll we'll end it there. Uh, Susan, does that make sense? Thanks. Um... So first, I want to agree with, of course, with Jackie Cabasso and Paul about the value of the Poor People's Campaign. But uh, with respect to the to the question that John McDougall uh, asked right in the beginning about Congress people voting uh, for these programs in the district, I mean, it's really important to mention, remember that for most people, their job, especially a job with benefits, is the most important thing in their life. It's what allows them to put food on the table for their children. It's, a, it's what allows them to pay the rent. It provides uh, health insurance. This notion that a job is just something that, you know, a job at Raytheon is just some more, you know, immoral thing. No, right? So I, I personally think that the campaign should focus on those people who aren't getting employed by Raytheon, such as last year, the March for Hunger, or was it two years back? Uh, and the more recent demonstration. And we shouldn't be focusing on Raytheon employees, right? That's their livelihood, right? We should focus on the people who are in poverty because all our tax dollars are going to Raytheon. And it's very easy to get those things uh, um, confused. On a college campus, it's different because they're not yet employed uh, by Raytheon. But let's keep our focus on those people who are being impoverished because of all the money that's going. Uh, uh, to Raytheon, and I think the campaign will be most successful in that arena, like Richard said, with the nurses and teachers, etc. Thanks, Paul. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, and let's we'll have one, one last question from uh, Michael Hoey. Just before going to that, just a reminder, please, if you want to be connected to the campaign in some way, please fill out the sign up, uh, the digital sign up form. The the link is in the uh, chat and you will also get it in the follow-up you'll, email you'll be getting uh, tomorrow or the next day with a recording of tonight's program, as well as some important links. Maybe we can put in an article, one of the articles from the Tufts uh, newspaper about uh, Nick's uh, actions, stuff like that. So keep an eye out for that. Please fill in that uh, sign up sheet. And then for those who live in the Boston area, please join us next Tuesday, August 30th, five o'clock at uh, Fresh Pond Parkway outside Fresh Pond Plaza. Uh, we'll be doing a standout, uh, com communicating this message to hundreds and hundreds of cars that go by at rush hour uh, at that particular point. Uh, let's close with a question from Michael Hoey. Michael. Yeah, it, it's mostly for Richard, although anyone can answer it. But the question I have is, um, you know, we're our unipolar dominance is diminishing and we're going to a multipolar world. It seems like we're, we're still trying to achieve this full spectrum dominance. And so my question is, there a benefit to pay attention to the different think tanks like um, CSIS or Atlantic Council or any of the others? Because they seem to be broadcasting globally on different platforms exactly <clears throat> how we're trying to maintain 
control over the planet. And so the rest of the world's that are tuning in seem to know exactly what we're trying to do, except those of us <laughs> in the peace movement who's, who are really turned off by it and don't, don't really want to know. We're trying to find something that we don't really seem to want to understand very well. And well, so I'm wondering, I, think that, I think that's just another area where we need to reach out more. Uh, there are more organizations all over the world. Some are international, some are national. Uh, they, they're not just peace groups. There are other kinds of groups. Uh, and they are, they're all increasingly commenting how the multi, multipolar world is here. It's growing. It's coming into existence. And how the U, U.S. is you know, doing everything it can to resist it and to maintain the multipolar world. But uh, the wavelength is that... Uh, everyone knows that the U.S. will lose, that the multi, the unipolar world is slipping away. And while the U.S. may be able to retard it, it can't stop it. And that it's a good thing that it's coming. And uh, it would be great if we can integrate our expertise into this uh, think tank world uh, that is increasingly on this wavelength to add our, our particular expertise to the conversation. That, that, would, that would be good. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Susan? Thank you, everyone, for coming, and those of you who stayed on. Uh, and again, this will be sent to you in a follow-up email with suggestions on how to participate. And again, oh, we, want your, we want your suggestions. If you didn't have a chance to... Uh, raise your hand or ask a question, please let us know because we want to hear from you. And this is our great new campaign. We hope it works out well. We hope we can make a, dis a difference. Uh, and all of us together, perhaps we can. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Susan. Hello. Great job, Susan. Uh, how are you doing? Oh, good. Uh, it was just terrible.